Yeah, it's uh, right here. Kind of, you look hotter than the picture. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. Yeah, right there. Are you nervous? Oh. No, here, this one. Oh. Yeah, I know it's little. Yeah. Okay. That's good. It's old fashioned, yeah? Yeah. When he comes out of the bathroom, he sees me. Oh, is there a light switch in here? Oh, it's behind his, doesn't it? Come on out, Joshua. Welcome to another episode with Mad Dimes MMA. We're back after a week of miscommunications, miscoordination. We couldn't get the 303 uh, video out, and I apologize for that. This card, uh, Rose Namajunas versus Tracy Cortez. Overall, a difficult card. I don't know. It's a bit crazy. But also to sal salvage UFC 303, I also posted a Magic Mike's prediction. And that shit flopped, bro. That that shit did not do well. But for the three viewers that did see it, you would see that Magic Mike went 2-0-1 in terms of predictions. Like, if you were to have tailed that shit, you would have made good money that night. The only thing that went wrong was the Brian Ortega fight getting voided. Besides that, easy money. But today, we're going to be breaking down the UFC Rose Namajunas versus Tracy Cortez with my buddy Tino and coming back the parlay master himself Aaron long time no see I'm glad to see you I see you're killing it how have you been so far how have you been doing hell yeah man happy to be here and I've been doing good um coming off of a really fire month in June a lot of solid pay-per-views and a lot of solid events to cover over there so Feeling pretty, feeling on top of the world going into July, and so looking to bring that momentum into this next card and hopefully cash out. Yeah, let's let's see if we can get some get some working on working with this. But kicking off the card, we have Josh Frem versus Andre Petrosky. Looking at it right off the bat, I was immediately thinking Andre Petrosky, easy. His wrestling should get it done because Andre Petrosky is he's a good wrestler, while Josh Frem isn't particularly good anywhere. He's Decently well-rounded. He's pretty tough as we saw with the Roman Kopilov fight. I mean, he was taking nasty body shots until he crumbled in round two. But then a couple big red flags showed up for me when I looked deeper into this. First off, Andre Petrosky is dumb. He is dummy dumb. Like, looking at his fight with Jacob Malkoon, he was doing exactly what he needed to do to get this fight done. And then he just had the weirdest, like, finish. Like, it, like... He knocked himself out, like in Michael Chandler fashion. Just went for a takedown, head right into the hip, just knocked himself out and got ground and pounded. And second, this is happening in elevation. Josh Fremd has been training in elevation. He's pretty used to it. I think I could trust him to keep a good pace. And Andre Petrosky, I think I could definitely see him trying to get the wrestling going and not being able to maintain that pace and just gassing out, slowing down, and Josh Frem picking it up. I don't think Josh Frem is particularly good anywhere, but I think this is a good ma matchup, for, matchup for him, considering where he's been training and how he's been able to maintain a good pace and the toughness he's been showing. So I think I'm going to lean Josh Frem to get this one done. I'm I'm liking the over. I think Josh Frem's tough enough to last a bit longer against Andre Petrosky. So I'm going to go with Josh Frem. What do you got for me, Tino? Yeah, uh, Josh Fremd, he's uh he's come in, he's he's fought some some pretty decent competition. Like you were saying, he lost to Copy Love, fought Fluffy Hernandez, fought G uh, Gregory Rodriguez in the LFA. So he's he's fought at a at a pretty high level. At, and but I, I think Petrosky here, uh I'm gonna I'm I'm picking Petrosky here. He's got eight finishes. He's a, a powerhouse when it comes to wrestling. He was a accomplished high school wrestler, uh, college wrestler. Uh, he can switch stances. I've noticed that Fremd, he likes he his right hand tends to drop, and Petrosky likes to hop in and throw those big hooks and shoot those blast doubles. So I, I think I think Fremd could get caught here with a punch, and then petrosky could take over with wrestling and find the neck either with an arm triangle or an anaconda choke uh and get the sub so i'm gonna take andre petrosky here i think i just think he's uh the better grappler i think he's gonna be able to control the fight and i think he's got the better power 
Yeah, I, I do kind of agree with Tino in that aspect too. Um, I do lean the Petrowski route here. Um, one thing that I do want to consider though, and I think is going to be a big factor on this card, is the elevation. So for these dudes that, that tend to gas or may not have those reliable gas, I think they're best to stay away from. So either way, I would not bet this fight. This is really like a, a 1-800 campers fight. <laughs> I'd stay away personally, but I do lane Petrosky, honestly. I, I think as long as his cardio can hold up, I think he's going to have the athleticism edge here too. And I do think that both these guys are going to kind of mix in the grappling. But what I do trust, I think Petrosky is going to be the dude to kind of out dog friend in those situations when it comes to scrambles. And he's going to be the dude that really pushes the pressure to end up on top or being the most advantageous positions during those times so with that being said too i i do believe he has more power on the feet and i think he can find his shots a little bit better but the one thing that i i do worry about taking petrosky is just that cardio but i'm gonna lean with him here um i'd like like tino said too i think frem does leave his neck out there sometimes too and to get choked out by a standing guillotine by treshawn gore I, I don't like to see that we're coming into a fight with Petrosky who's pretty solid on the mat and he does tend to find those arm triangles or just anything to do with catching those subs involved in the neck. So I, I, I do trust Petrosky here and that's who I'm going to lean with. Uh, moving up the card, we have Montel Jackson versus Damon Blackshear. I will never forget how Damon Blackshear, seven days notice, went on to fight Mario Batista and arguably won. Like, I I thought he was about to get it done, but I, I don't know if I entirely agree with that decision. And this is one of those fights I've been going back and forth on, because in my mind, Montel Jackson, he's the bigger opponent, he's going to be better on the feet, and he's got a good wrestling background. And then I look into their, then, I'm, then I look into their competition they've been fighting recently, and it's like night and day. Like, round one finish against Ronnie Yaya, Julio Arce, JP Baez, like, who are these guys? They're like low competition. Then you look at Damon Blackshear, Mario Batista, seven days notice. Jose Johnston, that twister was crazy. Luen Lacerda is not, I wouldn't rate as high competition, but definitely Fareed Basharat. And also, I, I think I like Damon Blackshear on the on the mat to stay active and to mix it up and to be and work for those submissions. I mean, that twister in itself was insane. Like, what was it? One of two? Like, you don't see that every day. And honestly, it's a matter of can Montel Jackson keep it on the feet? Because I think Blackshear is going to go in there and try to immediately get it to the mat. And I think Montel Jackson is going to be better on the feet and he's going to want to keep it standing. I think that's where his wrestling background can definitely, like, kick in. And as much as I'm, I want to pick Blackshear because I think he's a dog, I think I'm just going to have to side with Montel Jackson. I think he's going to be the bigger opponent. He's going to be better on the feet. And I think his wrestling background can do something to keep it standing. So I'm going to take Montel Jackson to get this one done. It's going to be a bit of a sweat. So be cautious of putting a rack on Montel Jackson. But what do you got for me, Tino? Yeah, I'm actually liking Montel Jackson here. Uh, he's got massive fists. He's got huge power. Very strong wrestler, super athletic, 71% takedown accuracy. Um, at times, he can be kind of methodical, like against Julio Ars. Yeah, kind of. It took him a while to to get the fight going, but once he did in the third round, he drops Ars and kind of controls the fight from there. Uh, Demon Blackshear, though, he's he's fought like like uh, you were saying, he's fought really solid competition. Even outside the UFC, he's fought solid competition like Danny Sabatello, solid grappler, and then he fought Pat Sabatini on the on the regional scene as well. And he's a he's a BJJ black belt, also. Uh, but I think Montel Jackson should be will be better everywhere, whether it be standing or on the ground. I think I think Jackson, sh if he takes it to the ground, he should be able to control uh, Blackshear. But I think I see Montel Jackson. Uh, Hurting Blackshear on the feet and then getting a, a probably like a third round st uh, stoppage against Blackshear. So I'll take I'll take Montel Jackson here. So right off the bat, I'm gonna pick Montel. I mean, if if we got Demon on a full camp, 
then maybe I'd have different opinions on this, but I do think that this is going to be a close fight. I honestly see it going all three. Like, I know Montel has, he does have power. Um, he did have that crazy knockout on Yaya, but one thing about Jackson is I do feel like he's pretty low volume compared to Demond. So I feel like the thing is when this fight's on the feet, he's going to have to find that counter shot with Demond. And I feel like Blackshear is seasoned enough to at least see or at least be aware of those potential openings that he he would open up against someone like Montel Jackson. But the thing that worries me the most is the short notice. Um, I do I don't believe that Demond's going to be too prepared for this fight. I feel like this is definitely going to be something that he's kind of just taking on the fly, essentially. But I, I see this being pretty close. Um, I think on the mat they're both pretty similar. Um, the thing is, is, I feel like Demond does push a better pace on the mat, and I think that he does work to get to those better positions. But Montel does also have that very credible wrestling background. But again, I think elevation could potentially be a factor with this matchup too. Um, I don't necessarily know how much I trust the gas tank of Montel, especially out of favorite right now. But I do think that he's going to grind this out. I will take Montel by decision. But again, I think Demond's just going to have to be wary of those shots on the feet. But I do trust that he's he's going to be savvy enough to not get caught with anything. I could see him potentially getting hurt. I don't see him getting put out, though. I feel like he's pretty tough. But I do think that Montel will at least have those bigger moments or at least win the first couple rounds. And I, I could see him catching that decision for sure. You know, you know, when you're uh, when you were breaking that down, I was thinking, what's a good bet for this one? Because I I like I like how you put that together. Damon Blackshear being a seasoned enough being tough enough what do you think about plus three and a half for damon blackshear i don't mind that at all because like i mentioned too like i know he's taking the spot on short notice but i kind of lean like if we're going off of who has the better cardio i i kind of lean demon honestly like even in these fights that he's lost i feel like he's pushed a good pace and even if you go through his record like He's faced solid competition, and like I know Yusuf Salal has improved a lot since the fight he's had with Demond, but I like to see that Demond still had a draw with that guy, and I feel I do rate Yusuf Zalal pretty highly, honestly. So one thing that I can rely on with Demond is he's gonna push the pressure, even if I feel like he's behind in the fight. So I could definitely see Montel maybe winning the first round, maybe the second round, but I feel like Don, I feel like Demond could edge out that third round, so I don't mind that plus three and a half at all. You know what could be a fun bet? What? Uh, Montel Jackson scores a knockdown. He's, what? At, he's got he's got six consecutive in six consecutive fights. He scored a knockdown. I'm definitely gonna have to look at that when the props drop. But moving up the card, we have Luana Santos versus Maria Agapova. Uh, Maria Maria Agapova is fighting for. I think she's fighting for her career at this point. She's on a bit of a losing skid. Uh. But I don't think she's going to get it done here. I think she Maria Agapova is definitely going to be dangerous on the feet. Honestly, I think she's actually going to be better than Luana Santos on the feet. Luana Santos, I think she wins. I think there's def, she definitely has the grappling advantage. Marina Maria Agapova, her takedown defense is questionable at best. Like that's, you'd think at this point she'd be getting better at grappling, and considering that. Not only did she, she get subbed in their last two UFC fights against Jillian Robertson and Marina Moroz, but she also went ahead and f fought in Karate Combat 46 and got heel hooked in round one. Maria Agapova's grappling is suspect, and I think Luana Santos definitely has the ability to take it to the mat and perhaps get another sub here. So give me Luana Santos to get this one done. What do you got for me, Tino? Yeah, I'm liking Luana Santos here. Um... I think if she implements a game plan kind of like Marina Moreau's did against Agapova, she should easily be able to get the win. She's got a, a judo black belt, so she just gets the fight up against the fence, gets the takedown, and kind of takes advantage on the ground. I think she should be able to most likely get a finish against Maria Agapova. Agapova has been finished. I think Mar Shana Dobson uh, finished Mar Maria Agapova, and that's it's not a good look at all. Uh, so... Yeah, keep it short and simple. Uh, I'll take Luana Santos here inside the distance. Yeah, I'm going to go with Luana Santos too. I mean, 
with Maria Agapova's last fight, man, I I legit thought she died in there <laughs> against <laughs> Jillian Robinson. That was one of the nastiest rear naked chokes I've ever seen in my life, and that literally happened in women's MMA. So that's just crazy to me. But I think there's something very glaring standing out here. I mean. I don't think Akapova has shit on the mat, really. So I feel like this literally could look like a situation where Luana could get one takedown around, either ride it out and just secure that round. Or if she really goes for it, I think that she could find that finish. Um, as crazy as it is to say, I think Akapova just, I know she's trying to work on that grappling and I'd like to see that she's taking up other uh, bouts and such to try to sharpen that up a little, little bit. But I still think that she's just, Something's not connecting there, and I think that she still makes those mistakes on the mat. And if someone with the caliber that Luana has on the mat, I think that she can look pretty dominant here. And I really do believe that she could either get one takedown around, keep Agapova there, or she could, she, if she really pushes the pressure, I think that she could find that finish too, whether that be just ground and pound or a submission. But what I'm going to lean with here is I think that she'll get to those dominant positions and... I could see her taking the back, trying to get a choke. I could see Agapova trying to fight that off, and then just Santos just pounding her out. I just don't think <laughs> Agapova is very aware on the mat at all. But hey, she's fighting for her career, so whatever that's worth, I think that she's gonna have that extra determination, as you will, or motivation to try to get that win. But I think it's—I want to say a gimme matchup, but I think it's—it's kind of tailor made, and it's a great style matchup for Santos. So. Like Tino, I'm going to take Santos inside the distance. Yeah. What about Luana Santos by sub? Are you are you sold on her to get the ground and pound? Or do you think that she has a better chance to get the sub? <laughs> Man, I, I think the door's wide open to get the sub, honestly. I guess it just depends on what route she wants to go with. Because I think... Uh, I could definitely see again to those dominant positions on the mat, whether that be like a full mount and Agapova's just trying to un in, uh, unintelligently get out of that position. I could see her either giving up her back or rolling into something and getting subbed off that. So I guess it just really depends on how Luana wants to go about it. But if the sub prop is, is decent odds, then I wouldn't mind that look at all. But to be safe, I'm as a safe bet, I guess I would take it inside the distance. But hey, I mean, that's the glaring part, factor about this whole matchup to begin with. So I could definitely see Santos getting that sub. Yeah, moving up the card, we have Jasmine Jesuda Vicious versus Fatima Klein. Or Klein. I think I got it. But this is overall going to be a wrestling match. This is definitely going to be an overmatch. I think this is going to be mostly a grappling match but also at the same time usually with those with grappler versus grappler sort of fights it's going to be a big stand-up affair weirdly enough uh but i think fatima is taking this one on short notice and yeah no she is taking this on short notice and it's weird that she's going up against jasmine jasuda vicious who's a proven grappler uh coming off oh yeah she's coming off that darsh choke against priscilla kakawera and Honestly, I, th I gotta go with Jasmine Jasuda Fishes. Uh, first off, elevation on short notice does not mix well together. So I don't know how I'm feeling about Fatima taking this one on short notice and being able to maintain a grappling pace. And also, I think Jasmine Jasuda Vicious is just a bit more proven than Fatima. Uh, I think this being her... I think this is her debut. Yeah, no, it's her debut. She just came off that decision win against... Andressa Romero. She's just been f fighting a lot of regional scene competition who weren't anyone particularly good. Uh, and I just think I can trust Jasmine Jasuda Vicious, who has definitely been the more proven one, and especially at underdog odds, like to just keep up a better grappling pace than Fatima and get a decision win over her. So give me Jasmine Jasuda Vicious to get this one done. What do you got for me, Tina? Yeah, um,. Fatima Klein, she's she's gonna be an interesting prospect to look out for. She was actually scheduled to fight on uh, Dana White's Contender Series in September, so the UFC's actually kept an eye on her. So opportunity came, she uh, opened the door for it, taking this fight on, a, I believe, at a week's notice. But she's a she's a former uh, CFFC strawweight and flyweight champion. She's the main training partner of Aaron Blanchfield and. 
she's got a pretty extensive uh, pro grappling record. She's 15 and six as a pro grappler, and I believe she's got I believe she subbed Vanessa Demopoulos in uh, in the grappling scene. So her path to victory here is to grapple, but I don't know if she's gonna taking it on short notice. I don't know if she's gonna be in the condition, especially in the elevation, uh, to go out there and uh, implement a grapple heavy uh, game plan. So I think uh, Jasmine Dish Jas is uh, uh, the proven veteran here. She's fought tough competition already, so um, I'll take Jasmine Jastavicius, but uh, Fatima Klein is is somebody to keep, keep an eye out for, so it wouldn't surprise me if she comes out and uh, puts an impressive performance on, but I'll take Jasmine here. What do you think, Aaron? You going to take a shot at Fatima? For me, I... It's hard for me to pass up on Jasmine at plus odds. I mean, she's the one that had the full can to prepare for this. She's a UFC vet at this point, and she's she's clearly been improving over time. And I think the thing that, that really sells me on her, too, is that she has the grappling here to either stifle what Fatima has or at least keep this fight on feet. My one takeaway, though, is I don't know how much I trust Jasmine in the striking department. I feel like really her bread and butter is when she can get that grappling going. But with Fatima, looking over her record, I do see that she does have a lot of solid grappling wins. Like she, like Tino mentioned, she does have that armbar win over Demopolis. Looking over it, though, if you do dive a little deeper, I do you see that she did lose a decision in grappling to Juliana Miller, which I'm going to be real. I just think Miller's absolute shit. I mean, <laughs> maybe she's not too bad at grappling, but I don't like to see that. But again, though, what that also does tell me is that Fatima is clearly improving over time. And I do like the fact that she does train with Aaron Blanchfield. So you know that she at least will attempt to stay true to the game plan that she's bringing in. And clearly the UFC has had their sights on her. But I think this is a clear situation of just the up and coming prospect taking that opportunity to get into the UFC. Of course, you would rather skip going through the contender series because you're honestly taking that risk but if you're taking this fight on short notice essentially you're just signing to a three fight contract you don't even gotta potentially even risk that opportunity of getting into the ufc or not so i think that she's kind of just taking advantage of that and for me to take a, a short notice up and coming prospect like like herself she better be as good as felipe lima that we saw a couple weeks ago and that's just not necessarily what i see here i think that she's an improving prospect but um, I, I think she's gonna fall short here. So I am gonna take Jasmine by decision, honestly. I think this is a great fight to bet the over on, even potentially a live look. But man, Jasmine at dog odds, I, I can't pass up on that. I think that she'll be prepared here. Yeah, no, uh, like I said, elevation's just not the place you want to take a short notice on. I think we're gonna see a good showing from Fatima, but it, you know what I'm kind of seeing with this fight? Diego Lopez versus Mazvar Evlev. Like, not a not necessarily a win for Lopez, but a very good showing that keeps that persuades the UFC to keep him around. Uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing with this. But moving up the card, we have Joshua Van versus Charles Johnson. Charles Johnson seemed to have finally found his stride because for a little bit he was making me look like a fucking idiot. Because I ever since like his fight with like Ode Osborne, I'm like, he's good, I swear to God. And then he lost to Cody Durden. I'm like, I swear, he's good. I swear. Then he loses to Rafael Esteban. And, I, and still I'm saying, he's still good. Give, let him cook. And then finally, he goes out and gets it done against Azat Maxim. And then against Jake Hadley, where I was finally like, you know what, maybe he's not good. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. And finally, that's where he, he decides, I'm a cook. I'm a cook in front of my hometown and beat Jake Hadley. Like here in this fight, I think it's going to be very close because from what I've seen in some of the tape with Joshua Van, like with Kevin Boras is he's kind of a slow starter. He's kind of losing until he finally picks up his rhythm or his opponent starts slowing down. And then he finally starts pressuring him and gets his combinations together. 
And that's kind of what I'm getting with, with Joshua Van. Charles Johnson, on the other hand, he has very crisp boxing too. And I think he can land nice combinations, but also something I picked up against Jake Hadley is that Charles Johnson does get caught on the back foot. So I definitely can see uh, Joshua Van picking it up as he continues to pressure Charles Johnson. And I think gets a decision win off, off Charles Johnson. I'm feeling the safest bet here is going to be Charles Johnson plus three and a half because I do think he keeps it relatively close or at least gets one, like either round one or two going. Uh, but overall, I think I'm going to go with Joshua Van to really pick it up, pressure Charles Johnson, and start landing the combinations as Charles Johnson is on the back foot. So give me Joshua Van to get this one done. What do you got for me, Tino? Yeah, this is a fight I'm looking forward to. I think it's uh, got a fight of the night potential all written all over it. You got two two exciting strikers that are willing to come forward and strike. So it'll definitely be a fun one to sit, kick back and watch. Um, I'm leaning Josh Van here, though. He's a young 22-year-old, and it just seems like he's uh, improving with every fight he takes. Uh, Charles Johnson, he... Chris Boxer, but it, he's he's looked impressive in his last two fights. But before that, it just seems like he he leaves the door open for fighters to you know to he just fight, he always fights a close fight, and it kind of always leaves that door cracked for the uh, his opposing fighter to you know kick it wide open and get a decision win. So I think Josh Van is going to just be the cleaner, uh, sharper striker here. And I could I, I see him winning a unanimous decision, just you know, out voluming Charles Johnson. I think I think he's gonna learn from previous fights that he needs to step on the gas a little bit earlier. So uh, I expect to see a a, a very uh, hungry Josh Van in there and really take it to him for three rounds. So I'll take Josh Van by decision. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, so this is uh, definitely one of the fights I'm looking forward to the most this weekend. Um, I think it's going to be a high-level matchup for sure. Um, what I'm leaning with here is I'm going to take Josh Van by decision too. Um, when you look at Charles Van, at least his, or excuse me, Charles, um, Charles Van. Johnson's <laughs> resume. <laughs> Do I hear a new <laughs> physical resume. fighter? Dude, could you imagine <laughs> that mix-up? <laughs> with the with the Scarlet too? I should have yeah, crazy, I know. but... <laughs> Anyways, when you see when you look over Johnson's resume, he he hasn't really faced anyone with the striking caliber that Josh Van has. And even against Hadley, which was very shocking to me in this matchup, it was weird to see that being a stand-up affair and Hadley not necessarily go for the takedowns as much as I would have imagined he would have. But with this matchup here, I think it's primarily gonna take place on the feet. So when you're considering that. If you're trying to pick Charles Johnson, do you think that he's going to out-volume Josh Van? I mean, even if you look at the stats that they have with, with Josh Van, over just three fights in the UFC, he's landing 9.08 strikes per minute. And with Charles Johnson, he's landing 4.48. So if you're going off the fact that you know this is going to be on the feet, you kind of have to trust that Johnson's going to be the one pushing that pressure. We know who has the power advantage for sure. I'd say that goes to Van. But, but trying to find a reason to take Johnson I just I don't see him being able to out volume on the feet the one thing I do like though is I think plus three and a half may be a solid bet for Johnson just because I think he, he may be that dude that's at least starting out at a higher pace than Van in that first round so I can maybe see CJ stealing that first round but I think Van will start to open up and I do think he realizes that he does have to kind of get on the gas pedal a little bit more in these fights to make it a little bit more decisive but I do trust him over the three to three rounds to be the one having the bigger moments, be the one to turn up the volume as the fight goes on. And I trust him to kind of grind out this decision. I think it will be close, but I got to ride with Josh Van here. I think he's going to be prepared. And if it's going to be a stand-up affair, I, I got to take the better striker here. So I'm going to lean with Van. Yeah, definitely one of the more exciting fights on the card. But and I'm glad that we're all on agreement here. Like, this is going to be a close fight. Joshua fans probably going to pick it up. It feels like it's going to be the same story all around. But moving up the card, we have Cody Brundage versus Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Now, this one was making me crazy. 
like trying to think of this like cody i want i I was thinking is this another cody brundage fade and i think it's going to be another cody brundage fade like cody brundage i don't know how he did it but in his fight against bo nickel like i had to rewatch this a couple times in his fight against bo nickel like he was getting dominated by bo nickel don't get me wrong but he was getting dominated in such a way where he was playing it off like he was not getting dominated at all. Like like he threw Bo Nickel off at one point. Like when Bo Nickel was getting that control time, he's punching himself in the face. Like, like you don't you can't hurt me. And then he got rear naked choked in the second round. Like Like I didn't I don't know how he did it. And I think Cody Brundage's way of winning here is to get the wrestling going. And he's going up against Al Hassan, who who does have a little bit of a judo background. I don't know how much it's gonna be it's gonna play into this one. But he's Al Hassan's the type of guy who was a judo thunder, as you see, who's a grappler who fell in love with his hands. He's get racking up some nice knockouts. I mean, against D Tarico, Claudio Ribeiro, who I rate very much. And then he had a nice split decision fight against Joaquin Buckley, which is starting to age very well. I think Al Hassan is gonna get this one done in the striking. I think he can get this done early on against Cody Brundage, who I don't think is particularly good. He almost fooled me into thinking maybe he's not that bad, but yeah, no, he's pretty pretty bad. How are you getting knocked out by William Knight in the first round? Like, how are you getting out grappled and dominated by Cedric Dumas? Like, no, no, he's not. He's not good. <laughs> he's not. He's not a good striker. His Grappling is mid. Like, I think Al Hassan gets it done here. On the feet. Probably in round one or maybe early round two. Give me Al Hassan to get this one done. What do you think, Tino? Yeah, I got to agree with you here. Uh, we got a guy in uh, Abdul Razak Al Hassan who's got absolute heavy hands, big kicks. He can. He can put your lights out with one strike against a guy who does not face adversity at well at all. We've seen Cody Brundage kind of just quit or get hit with something and, you know, he just clocks and calls it an early night and clocks out early, you know. Uh, and I think it's going to be uh, uh, the Brundage's uh, college wrestling background versus uh uh, Al Hassan's uh, judo black belt, and I think the grappling is kind of kind of going to cancel each other out, and we're going to have uh, a standing affair. And like uh, LC was saying, I think uh, Al Hassan can can catch Brundage and make it a short night. And I think uh, Al Hassan wins inside the distance here, probably just by KO. I don't see him getting a sub, but I think Al Hassan clips Brundage and gets a finish here. What do you got, uh, Aaron? Yeah, I'm going to have to go with Al Hassan. Um, for starters, before I dive into this, if you're betting this, you need help 100%, bro. This is another super sus fight I would not even touch. But I got to go with Al Hassan here. I mean, I've been harping on this the whole time but i think elevation is going to be a big factor in this matchup especially with someone like brundage i think he has the skill set to pull this off i think honestly like he really is the more well-rounded fighter here in this matchup in my opinion and with the right game plan and the right cardio he really could get a, a grappling game plan here and, and win the fight i feel like or at least do enough to win two rounds but I do not trust him at all at elevation, and I really just don't trust his his grit at all in general. I think, like Tino said, when the going gets tough, he he kind of just cracks like an egg. And Al Hassan, I think, just, he packs a lot of power, and I I think Brundage is there to be hit on the feet. So I gotta go with Al Hassan here. I can see him finding that knockout on the feet, but this is just a super sus fight in general. So I think Al Hassan may be a uh, a KO or bust kind of fighter. I feel like he may not find that. I could see Brundage potentially grinding this out, but I can't pick Brundage at elevation. So I, I got to lean on the fact that Al Hassan finds that shot and 
he wins the fight. So that, that's going to be my pick, but definitely no confidence there. I'd say I'm about 51, 49%, honestly, but got to ride with Al Hassan. It, it's funny because right when you were saying that, I'm like, man, maybe I should take Al Hassan to find the KO in like round one or two. And then all of a sudden you're like, if you bet on this, you need help. <laughs> you, you need to find the right people to help you out here. Sure. <laughs> I just think the depth of better spots, but hey, like the price tag's worth it and we got a good number on that first round. I, I think that's his path to victory, honestly. So like I wouldn't mind it if it's like a, a plus six hundred or something like that. But in general, if you're taking a money line or anything, I mean you need God, but I'm gonna pray for you. Yeah, no, I, I was like, man, Al Hassan minus one fifty five. I wonder what KO Al Hassan by KOTK looks like. I mean it's possible, but Hell, I don't know. Cody Brundage kind of fucked me over with Zachary, so I guess I can't count him out, can I? But moving up the card, we have Christian C. Rod Rodriguez versus Julian Arosa. Right off the bat, I was like, no brainer. Christian Rodriguez. He's slick on the feet. He's got good grappling. I mean, granted, I don't know how the hell he got that decision win over Isaac Dolgarian, especially after that brutal first round. But it seems like he's got it all. He's got the grappling, he's got the striking, he's got the refs in his pocket, like he's got everything he needs. But looking into this fight, I think I'm gonna go with Julian Arosa. Because first off, first advantage Julian Arosa has is that he's not a rising prospect, so he's actually got some experience under his belt. And not just that, but he's gonna be the bigger opponent here. Christian Rodriguez finally giving up a, like his rivalry against the the scale and moving up a weight class. And Christian Rodriguez is fighting, what, surprisingly, the bigger opponent, Julian Arosa, who's got a four-inch height advantage. And I think it's also a three-inch, four-inch reach advantage. So definitely going to be the bigger opponent. So I think Christian Rodriguez might have the edge in the striking department. But I think the big, the, the big thing that's going to probably be the thing that gives Julian Arosa the win here is I think he's going to mix in the grappling very well. Because some, when looking through the tapes with Christian Rodriguez, there was a fight that really stuck out with me. And that was his fight against Jonathan Pierce. It was, back, it was a back and forth on the feet. And the thing that really decided for Jonathan Pierce was the takedowns he was getting. Like, he, he that was the takedowns, working for the control time, working for submissions. And I think that's exactly what jo Julian Arosa is going to do here what's he going to do to get this one done is he's going to get the takedowns and I think he's going to be very active on the mat and being able to maintain that control time is also going to be helpful in more one uh, more than one way because not only that but that's also somebody Christian Rodriguez is going to have on top of him going to be wearing down his endurance already in elevation so I think Julian Rod Arosa is going to be able to get this one done with his grappling advantage so I think I'm gonna have to take Julian Rosa at nearly plus 200 under uh, underdog to get this one done. What do you got for me, Tino? Yeah, Christian Rodriguez. He's been kind of a uh, the prospect killer in his last three fights, beating Dilgarian, Simon, and Raul Rosas Jr. Uh, he's coming in there and kind of kind of put a put a quiet on the on the on the prospect talks on the, all those three although hostess jr is still young rodriguez though he just seems like he's a guy that him and his camp they they put on they put together really good game plans for him and uh rodriguez is really a jack jack of all trades he's got great striking he's a great grappler um but your julian rosa is not a prospect you know he's seen it all he's got a a very very uh big record he's the veteran of the sport um but i like christian rodriguez here i think rodriguez is gonna be able to uh out grapple uh Yorosa, or if it stays on the feet he'll be able to outstrike Yorosa. But, but i trust that rodriguez and his camp are gonna come to this fight with a with the right game plan to beat julian Arosa. So I'll take Christian Rodriguez, but Eros is a crafty vet, so it wouldn't surprise me if he he can come out here and pull an upset. Yeah, he and Eros is getting nice subs though. Like 
against Sean Woodson. Like, you're not seeing Sha- anyone take down Sean Woodson anymore. Like, no, Euros is really crafty out, out there. He's got really slick striking and he's pretty, pretty crafty on the mat as well. So, not a bet, not a fight that I'm willing to bet on, but I'll not even a shoeing. If you're on, you're on Rosa. Yeah, I'm on Rosa. Yeah, Juicy we'll, J, baby, do it for the streets. Let's 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 do a shoey. Help. I'm confident in Rodriguez. So. Wow! Wow! You went from like I don't really know. Rosa is a crafty vet to. Yeah, I mean, I'm confident. I'm not confident. Put some <laughs> money, but I'll 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 I'll, I'll bet a, I'll bet some beer in a shoe. <laughs> oh yeah, let's see how confident you are now. How about a double shot in that shoe? Yeah, let's see how confident. I've been kind of going back and forth as this fight has been announced on who I'm kind of riding with and what side I'm more leaning towards. But the thing is with Christian Rodriguez is I feel like he's the kind of fighter that almost fights to his opponent's skill. And one thing about him is like he's kind of like a cockroach a little bit. Like if you don't kill him. He's going to come back and he's still going to be there in your face to start of round three. I mean, we've seen him get dominated by Dulgarian. We've seen him get dominated by Rosas. I mean, let's be real. In these matchups, I feel like if these guys didn't gas out, I, th- I think he's dead there. So w- with that being the case, when you consider that a factor in this matchup, I just I look at Juliana Rosa and I'm trying to find reasons or trying to find ways of how he can make this a, a tough matchup. I think he definitely can get some takedowns, but with C-Rod, I think he's, he's faced a lot of solid grapplers already, and I think he's he's kind I think he's going to be ready for that. I think he's going to be able to, to stifle those takedowns that Rosa may have. Um, I, I'm trusting in Rodriguez's cardio here too, and I, I, I like who he trains with at uh, Ruko Sport. I think they're going to come up with a solid game plan. But again, when, when we're talking about camps, I think DeRosa is going to have a solid game plan too because he trains with Eric Nixick and the gang at, at Extreme Couture. But purely when I when I really dive into this, I I don't see E. Rosa really posing too much of a threat anywhere. Essentially, I, just, I don't see him sticking to a grappling game plan and being able to keep Rodriguez there for two rounds, especially at elevation. I do think that at this point, Rodriguez is improving. He's the younger fighter. He, even if he gets down to the mat, I think he'll be the dude to fight back up and, and, and get it back onto the feet. And with the Rosa, you cannot trust that chin. I mean, I think his durability is definitely falling off a cliff. And in my honest opinion, I have not seen an Rosa performance that I've really been impressed with since the Hakeem Dawudu fight. And we're talking almost about two years ago. So with this here, I think Rodriguez will do just enough to edge out a decision. But a sneaky play is I, I would not rule out a Rodriguez by KO, honestly. I think Rosa doesn't have a chin. I think that durability has fallen off a cliff. And if that Rodriguez KO prop is is pretty juicy, I, I think it'd be worth a sprinkle. But as just a pure pick, I, I got to take Rodriguez and by decision. Ooh, kind of worries me that the Parley Master is now going against me like a and not just that, but thinking Rodriguez gets the finish. That ooh, making me worry about that chewy bet now. All of a sudden, <laughs> dude. I mean, if it really was like any other fighter that's kind of around that same ranking or caliber as a Rosa, I wouldn't mind fading Rodriguez here. But with the Rosa, I, I kind of feel like he's falling off a cliff a little bit. I know he just is coming off of a win, but Ramos, I really don't rate and. With that being the case, I, I do think that Rodriguez is on the trajectory going up. And I just, I don't see Rosa bringing anything to the table that will really secure a win here for him. I don't see him sticking to the grappling. And I don't see it necessarily working for a long period of time. So I, I got to go with Rodriguez, bro. All right. Moving up the card, we have Gabriel Bomfim versus Ange Loose Asshole. Uh, you know... I think the bookies, or us in general, have not learned our lesson because Bonfim is a minus four hundred, and I think I can I think I can understand why. Because first off, Angelus asshole is a quitter. Like he like people argue that he was on his way to getting finished by Brian Battle, and then he found a way out with the eye poke, and that is very understandable. But at the same time. 
Gabriel Bonfim gassed so hard against Nicholas Dalby in Brazil. Like, if he's gassing against Nicholas Dalby, who I don't think is bad, but yet again, it's in Brazil. You know how crazy their crowd is. How is he going to fare any better in elevation? And Angelusa, like, he's a tough guy to finish. Like, granted, like I said, Brian Battle may be on his way. Like, you, you can make that argument. But JDM couldn't do it. And if JDM, who I think is going to be the is the crisper boxer, couldn't finish Ons Loose, how the hell is Gabriel Bonfim going to do it? Gabriel Bonfim's best chance is to get this done under one and a half. Because once it gets to the second round and he still hasn't finished Ons Loose, he, it's gonna it's downhill from there. I don't think he's gonna be able to maintain a pace. So this is definitely gonna be a live bet to look at. If Gabriel Bombfim does not get this done in the first round, Angelus, in my opinion, is gonna be live. I'm honestly thinking taking Lusa plus one and a half to at least win one round. Because I, I have to rate his durability. I think he's a very durable fighter. And I think I think even if the UFC like gives Gabriel Bonfim the fight, if it somehow goes to a decision, Angelus is going to at least get one round. I, I feel like it's going to be one of the later rounds. Or Angelus straight up wins the fight by a finish. Because Bonfim, I don't really rate his gas tank. So, but the pick is going to be Bonfim if I have to go with a straight pick. Because I think Bonfim... He, he does have a, I think he has a bit of a grappling advantage, and I think he's going to be the better boxer. His gas tank is really suspect to really trust minus 400. So the pick is going to be Bonfim, but the best that I'm really looking at is Angelus plus one, uh, plus three and a half. And maybe like Gabriel Bonfim to get the finish, decision no action, maybe, but I'm Really liking the loose of plus three and a half, especially at his odds. So, but give me Bonfim. Uh, what do you got for me, Tino? Against Dalby, I, there's no shame in for losing to Nicholas Dalby. He's a true veteran of the sport. He's fought the who's who. Um, but I just think I think Bonfim's going to be better here everywhere, whether it be on the feet or on the mat, especially be on the mat. But I I can see Bonfim kind of piecing up Lusa on the feet, getting a takedown, and getting a sub here. I think uh, Ange Lusa was on his way to losing to Brian Battle. I think Brian Battle is on his way to, on his way to finishing uh, Ange Lusa. But, yeah, I don't rate Ange Lusa too much. So, I'll I'll take Bonfim here. I think he wins by finish. I don't think he gasses here. Um like I was saying, I don't think there's too much shame in losing to Nicholas Dalby, but yeah, I think Angelus, I mean, I think Gabriel Bonfim's better here on the feet or on the mat, so I'll take uh, Bonfim inside the distance. What do you think, Aaron? Are you a bon uh, Dalby fan? <laughs> Dalby burned me in Brazil last time Bonfim fought, so definitely not a Bonfim fan for the most part, but Man, I was really trying to find a reason to take Lusa here. And I found a, a, a couple interesting factors. Um, Lusa has fought at Elevation before already and won. Um, I remember seeing this guy fight in Salt Lake on the Usman Edwards 2 fight car, I believe. And he didn't look too bad. I mean, let's keep in mind, though, he did fight AJ Fletcher, who isn't even with the organization anymore. So definitely lower level competition, but... Even at elevation, Lusa was still able to throw up 129 strikes and get two takedowns. And with that being a factor here, when you also look into his, his resume, Lusa's also never been finished in his career. Has never been subbed, never been KO'd. So I think he, he's pretty tough here. But when you dive into tape on Lusa and you watch his last fight, there's, there's definitely nothing impressive to see there. Um, he's definitely got... In my opinion, he was on his way to losing against Battle um, and ended up looking like a little bitch after the fight, too. <laughs> so, definitely not a good look at all for Lusa, but 
how I'm really seeing this fight now is do I trust Bonfim's cardio? Um, I know he's going to be at elevation and he, he really hasn't looked that great, honestly. But another factor as well is, is Bonfim has fought in Salt Lake City before as well. So I, I, I can't see him coming into this fight with the right game plan. And I, I see a big advantage in the grappling for Bonfim here. Um, I don't think I can see him getting a finish. I, I can maybe see him getting something early. But I honestly could also see another route where he, he just gets the takedowns, gains a lot of control time each round, and it even has that advantage on the feet. So maybe a hot take here, but I'm going to take Bonfim by decision. I'm definitely going to be sprinkling on that. It's just Andalusa, yeah, like I said, he looked like shit last fight. But from what I remember, during those grappling exchanges with Battle, like he didn't look terrible on the mat. And I'm not saying Battle's essentially on that same level as Bonfim when it comes to grappling, but I can see Lusa really just playing the defense on the mat and really do what he can to not get subbed. <laughs> so due to that fact, I can see Bonfim just getting a lot of control time while Lusa's just doing everything he can to, to fight off the sub. And you gotta imagine, he knows that that's what Bonfim's gonna be going for. I don't think he's too worried about anything Bonfim has on the feet. Moving up the card, we have... I know y'all remember Gun, Gunner Nelson too. But moving up the card, we have Drew Dober versus Gene Silva. I, I can't tell if Gene Silva is a dog or if Charles Jourdain have, has pillow hands for taking this on short notice against Drew Dober. I think I'm just going to save, help Charles Jourdain save face and say, Gene Silva a dog. He a dog. He taking this on short notice. And not just that, but going up a weight class to fight Drew Dober. And that's going to be interesting, going up a weight class and fighting an elevation. I don't know how that's going to look. I, before, I, well, first off, I'm picking Gene Silva because I think he's going to be the better. He's going to be the one to mix it up better on the feet. Drew Dober is the type of fighter who takes like three hits to land one bomb. I mean, we saw that against Bobby Green. Bobby Green was landing at will against Drew Dober until he got him up against the cage and landed that killer hook. And against Terrence McKinney, he was taking like mean all those mean shots from McKinney until he landed his own and got the ground and pound. Like, I can't like his striking defense is non-existent, and his chin is that which he's been relying on heavily is starting to show some cracks against well, as we saw against Terrence McKinney. Although he got the win, he did get dropped. Bobby Green was hurting him on the feet. That for steamroller for Vola just obliterated that chin like we're starting to see some cracks and for someone going up a weight class gene silva isn't going to be that much smaller than drew dober and i like i said before i bet on gene silva i want to see how he looks on the scale i want to see how well he transitioned to the weight class above especially on short notice I don't think it's going to be too much, too bad of a, I'd say a weight gain, but I think Gene Silva is going to be better on the feet against Drew Dober. I think his power is going to carry up. I think he's going to be able to mix it well on the feet. If you're betting on Drew Dober, you're basically betting on his chin to hold up. That's literally how he wins his fights. He's, he relies on his chin. He takes those shots well, wears the damage well, and lands his power shot. That's how Drew Dober wins. And that can only get you so far. And that's why I'm going to take Gene Silva to get this one done. What do you got for me, Tina? Yeah, I'm liking Gene Silva. Uh, how we put out uh, Jordan last week was pretty crazy. I don't I don't think I've ever seen Charles Jordan be put out like that. Uh, but he's going up against uh, Drew Dober, who's been, who's been cracked before. Matt Frivola knocked him out. Uh, when was it? Last year, I believe. Uh, he's been cracked before, so I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Gene Silva comes out here and and you know cracks that chin again. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ride the the momentum train and take Gene Silva here to get the fight done. I think he does crack uh, Drew Dober. Gets the and gets the finish, 
So yeah, I'll take Gene Silva here, but you know, Drew, no disrespect to Drew Dober, he's a real veteran in the sport, but I think I think Silva is just he's on that upward trajectory and trying to he's very hungry and he's trying to become that next uh, big Brazilian star. So I'll take Gene Silva here. Are you also on the hype train, Aaron? I, I think so in this matchup. I, I wish I was one of the few that got Gene Silva underdog gods, honestly, because I think he's the favorite now. But when I look into this fight, like with Drew Dober, I believe over his last five fights, he's been either rocked or dropped three times. I, I think, um, what's his face? Rafael Alves rocked him. Um, Frivola dropped him. McKinney dropped him. So, like, clearly, when you look at Dober, that, that durability is kind of falling off a cliff a little bit. And coming into this fight, when you're looking at John Silva, we know he's a featherweight coming up. But in my opinion, I think he's one of the bigger featherweights. I mean, even with his last fight with Jordan, he came in heavy with, I think he was 147 or something around there. And if he's coming in at 147, you've got to imagine this dude's probably walking around at like 165 or shit, maybe even 170 even. Who knows how big of a cut he's making. So I bring that up because I don't think size is going to be a major factor here. Um, I don't think Dober will be that much bigger. I honestly think they're going to be fairly even when it comes to um, physique, or at least the size. But with that being said, um, if the fight's going to stay on the feet, you kind of got to lean the John Silva route because he's coming off a lot of momentum, knocking out Jordan, the first man to do it. And with, with Dober, he's coming off a win with Ricky Glenn. And I'll, I'll admit, it looked like Dober did get his confidence back a little bit with that win, but... He, he wasn't really facing too much resistance to begin with in that matchup. It was essentially a gimme. So with this matchup, I think Dober may come in a little unaware. And I think he's going to he's gonna try to strike with John Silva on the feet. And that's not what I like. And I, I feel like if Dober was coming in here with maybe more of a, a grappling style or at least mixing that in a little bit, I could see him edging this fight out in a decision. But I don't necessarily see him finishing John Silva and I think he's going to kind of make the error of staying on the feet for too long. And I think John Silva's either going to have those bigger moments and win a decision, or he's just going to straight put Dober out. So I've got to go with John Silva here. But a factor I do want to bring up is I think Dober trains in Colorado, I believe, or has done training in Colorado. So if, if cardio is going to anyone here, i got to go with Dober, but I, I can't rely on that durability anymore. Yeah, ooh, good point though. Training in Colorado. Yeah, and moving up a weight class. Uh, ooh, if Silva can't get it done early, Jude Dober might be live. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Depending on the odds, man. I mean, if he's a big dog on fight night, I, I may have to sprinkle on Dober. I, I think essentially it's kind of his fight to win. Anyone's prepared, it's going to be him, but definitely risky man i just don't know I, I don't know if i trust him coming in with a solid game plan moving up the card we have santiago ponzinibbio versus muslim salikov now this is a battle between two aging ufc vets twilight year t twilight years of their career dusty chins for me this fight is a matter of Who's gonna land the significant shots first? Who's gonna start landing those power shots? Who's gonna start? Who's gonna have that grit to get past those heavy shots and keep up that pressure? And to me, although Muslim Salikov is probably gonna be the more technical striker between the two, I've been more impressed as of late by Ponzinibbio because although his chin isn't holding up as well as it used to. I really do rate like how he was hold hanging on till round three against Kevin Holland when I thought he was going to get absolutely annihilated by Kevin Holland. He was still hanging in there and try landing his shots, had his moments, but it was all Kevin Holland really. But and against Jeff Neal and Michelle Pereira, even though Michelle Pereira kind of almost fucked himself because he, you know him, he likes to showboat, gas himself out. But that shows me that. He's going to hang in there as long as he can and still try to edge that edge that win out. And I think that show of grit is impressive impressive for me. And I think that's going to 
be the defining factor between the two because I think they both have a lot of power. I think both their chins are rather questionable. They're aging. They're not. They're past their prime. And I think what it's really going to come down to is who has the grit and who's going to land those those power shots in a mostly striking affair. And I think that's going to be Ponza Nibio. I so give me Ponza Nibio to get this one done, probably by finish because Muslim Salikov. That first round finish against Randy Brown. Although Randy Brown lost to M's aging well, I, he's just not the same that he used to. 40 years old, elevation. I think the king of kung fu is going to set down his crown and retire at UFC Namayuna's Cortez. What do you got for me, Tino? Yeah, I'm gonna. I kind of agree with you here with Santiago Ponzinibbio. I think he's just going to be the. The, the crisper boxer I think he's gonna put the pressure on Muslim Salikov and Muslim Salikov's uh, he's aging he's a 40 year old welterweight and he's been knocked out and he got knocked out against Randy Brown and then he got knocked out against Jing Liang Li uh, the leech back in 2022 uh, and his his last win was against the chinny Andre Fialo and I don't you know, I don't put too much stock in that. So, uh, yeah, I think Santiago Ponzinibbio is going to be the hungrier guy. I think he's going to be the, the the crisper, more athletic striker. And I think he, uh, he, I think Ponzinibbio gets the knockout here. Uh, probably under two and a half. So, tough, tough matchup to call because they 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 both seen better days in their career but i think i think ponzinibbio just has a little bit more left in him yeah what do you think aaron man i was super close to picking muslim like super (laughs) super super close and then i i go and i look at his topology profile and this dude is so old his topology pick is literally in black and white (laughs) like so when I look at this, I dive more into his stats, right? And I, I see his recent, or I guess his most recent wins. And even his wins in the UFC, I'm not very impressed. And this dude is super low volume. And I think his age is essentially is his biggest problem right now. With being 40 at welterweight, I feel like this guy is definitely not in his prime anymore. And he's lost those that, that the peak and essentially the dynamics of his style that made him as good as he was back in his prime. Um, I think all of that's gone out the window. And even on top of that now, it seems like the durability has also gone out the window. So I know the same could be said with Ponza Nibio, but what I respect looking over his resume is it looks like he's faced at least, he's faced a higher level of competition recently. So with the losses he's faced, I really, I don't mind those, you know, the loss to Morono, the loss to Holland. I I don't think those are bad looks. I know in hindsight, Morono seems to be terrible now, but at the time, I really didn't mind that loss. So what it really comes down to here is I think Santiago is going to be the dude throwing the more volume. I think he's going to be the dude at least pushing the pressure. I think he's going to be the dude out dogging Muslim essentially in this fight. I think he's going to be the one going for it more. I, I feel like Muslim's going to be a little too tentative and, and waiting for that perfect shot. So I got to go with Santiago. Um, I don't know if he does enough to find a finish, but I'm, I'm going to go with Santiago. I'm not super confident in it, but at this point, I, I got to fade Muslim. I, I think this, like like you said, Elsie, I think this may be his last fight. And so we're going with Santiago here. Yeah, bro. Rest in peace to the king of kung fu. But moving up to the main event, Rose Namajunas versus Tracy Cortez. I'm going to keep this short, simple, straight to the point. I think Tracy Cortez wins. I I gave this a lot of thought. Rose Namajunas has fought the who's who of of women's MMA because she's been bouncing around weight classes. And I think Tracy Cortez is a step up from Amanda Ribas. I mean... I think when uh, Rose Namajunas is fighting technical grapplers, her pace drastically diminishes. I mean, look at the just look no further than the Carla Esparza. Like the fact the grappling threat was there seemed to like slow her down completely. And against Amanda Rebos, even Rebos was got like four takedowns against Rose, 
So you, the, her takedown defense is not all there. So even though Tracy Cortez has taken this on short notice, which makes me a little hesitant to bet on her, I think Tracy Cortez has has what it takes to take Rose down and control her on the mat. I think her grappling is def definitely there, and I think she has what it takes to uh, to win this by a decision. Because I don't think she's going to get the finish, but I think she's definitely going to slow down the pace with her grappling and edge out a decision. So give me Tracy Nurmagomedov to get this one done. I actually like Rose Nama Yunus here. Uh, uh, she's uh, actually training out of Colorado. And I'm I'm not really too impressed with Tracy Cortez's wins. You know, she, she's getting decisions over Jazz Davicius, Melissa Goddard, and then went to split decision with Justine Kish. I think Rose Nami Yunus has kind of seen everything the division has to offer. And uh, like you were saying, she you, you, you say she's kind of worried of those grapplers, but she faced adversity against Amanda Bahibas and still got the W. Yeah, she did get taken down a few times, but she was able to get back up. And I think that's going to be uh, the story here. I think uh, Cortez might be able to get her to the ground once or twice, but I think... I think Nami Yunus is going to be able to find her way back to the feet and uh, outstrike uh, Cortez for five rounds here. So I'll take uh, I'll take Rose Nami Yunus here uh, to win by decision. Yeah, Cortez is going to make her have to get up in elevation all those times. That's going to be fun. <laughs> but what do you think, Aaron? You on the Cortez Nurmagomedov train or Rose Nami Yunus? Man, this this would be so easy to break down if Rose was still training with Whitman. If she was still training with the boys and Trevor Whitman, I I, I would have no problem taking Rose here. I, in my opinion, I feel like she kind of has declined a little bit since just straight working with Pat Berry. And looking over her Instagram, though, it looks like she has been training with, with Pennington here a little bit. So to me, that tells me that she's at, at least prepping to, to at least understand that the takedowns are coming in so with tracy though the the question is is she a better grappler than amanda rebus is she gonna find these takedowns a little easier than amanda rebus is, is she gonna be able to have better top control than amanda rebus and that, that that's really what i'm having a hard time deciding here because i do think that cortez does get the takedowns but i just don't know if she can keep rose there um, we've even seen people like Whaley have trouble with keeping Rose on the mat. So I, I do think that she's, she does have great get up ability here. So, but looking into this, you, you see that it was a close fight with Rebuzz and that this is not the look I like to see coming into a fight with Cortez when I feel like primarily she's going to stick to that, that grappling a lot more than, than Rebuzz did. So with this matchup, man, I, I think I got a slightly lean Tracy, honestly, I I think she's gonna I think she's gonna stay true to that grappling game plan more so. The thing that worries me is the cardio, but I do like the gym that she trains out of. Um, she does train at Fight Ready with Henry Cejudo and such. So not only I think that is the cardio gonna be where it needs to be, but I think she's gonna come up with a solid game plan to not necessarily overexert herself and gas out. So I think Tracy will do enough to at least win three rounds here in a close decision. And I, I got to ride with it. I think Rose has just been hopping over too many gyms too much. And I, I hate the fact that she's just been relying on Pat Barry as the head coach. I think this is essentially going to be her downfall. But I, I got to go with Tracy. I, I think she she does enough to edge this out. Let's go. Fuck you, Tino. <laughs> hey, hey, fuck you. Uh, by the way, you want to do another shoe on this one? <laughs> Two yeah, shoeies. Okay, let's do a shoey. Ah, uh, no. Nah. You can to. Another shoey? Damn, two shoeies, huh? Man, this could be a shit night. <laughs> I bet. For I'm you. Down. Ah, for you, bro. You're going to have to take <laughs> two shoeies. For you. I don't to... know about that. I'm still waiting on your shoe to get here so Profit can take, take that shoe out of your shoe. Oh, yeah, that's right, huh? I totally forgot about that. You son of a bitch. <laughs> But if you guys had that shit gonna be so musty. It is, bro. Especially after it gets out of transit. 
But if you guys had one lock for this card, one like bet, you think without a shadow of a doubt it's going to hit, what would it be? Well, it can't be minus 1,000, obviously, but... I'll probably take Luana Santos straight. Yeah, personally, I'm liking Jasuda Vicious, Klein, to go to decision. Like, I think that's a straight decision. Man. Josh Van, baby. Damn, that's your lock, Josh Van. <laughs> I think it's a good style matchup, man. I mean, Johnson's not going to go for takedowns, and I don't think he's going to outstrike him. So, Josh Van and Josh Van by decision. I, and those are some good picks. I, I might just parlay all that stuff for real. But that's all we got for you guys today. Thank you all for watching. Hope you all enjoy, enjoyed. Chama Brothers.